My name is Torstein Gimnes Are, the Chief Information Security Officer of Norsk Hydro. We cover the whole value chain of aluminum production and then also making products for automotive and building industries. I received a phone call from one of my colleagues in aluminum metal telling me that they observed strange behavior in the IT systems in the plant. The whole plant was attacked at the same time, but the steering panels behind me here both went black, so you had nothing to steer the production after. The attack surface at that time was 25,000 PCs and 3 to 4,000 servers. A note left by the attacker, we have encrypted your data. The longer you wait, the more expensive it would be to get hold of the decryption key. In 2020, the world was struggling. Everyone was scared. Multiple large-scale ransomware gangs were competing to breach various networks. Big, large corporations started to get hacked, and the ransom demand started getting larger. Colleges, governments, police forces, ransomware gangs were flourishing. This was the start of big game hunting for ransomware crews. It gave us a rare insight into how ruthless these cyber crews can be. Ransomware is like the mother load of all problems for business. First, there's a computer intrusion and placement of malware on your system. Systems are usually locked up so you can't access them until you pay a ransom. Then you got to worry about the ransom itself. Do you pay the ransom? Do you not pay the ransom? Even once you pay the ransom, you got to get the data back. And you hope they give you a key to decrypt the data that's been locked up. After all of that, you've got to worry about litigation risk because now you've had customers or clients or partners whose businesses have been impacted by your ransomware attack. All of those things mean that it's not over in an instant. It's a whole process, and there's constant doubt in each one of those steps. medicine because I was always a science nerd. I particularly like small groups, so becoming a family practitioner made sense, where you get the privilege of knowing people pretty intimately. And it definitely gives you a perspective into uh, how wonderful people are. It's hard for me to recall the first time I heard the word ransomware. I tried to sign in through a static IP from home, and there was this big black screen. What do you do when your computer's acting weird? The first thing you do is reboot your computer, and sure enough, when I rebooted it, got the same message back. I went, something's wrong. The ransomware attack encrypted 20 years of patient medical records. My scheduling system, so truly had no idea who was going to be coming into the office. I was floored. The difficulty of this current issue is that there's multiple levels of victimization. Hi, I'm Joe Lyon. I'm an attorney in Cincinnati, Ohio. We've been representing individuals in data breach actions around the country. Social security numbers, dates of birth, passport numbers, driver's license numbers. You're requiring your employees or your customers to provide this sensitive information to you. It's the responsibility of the business owner to look at what can they do to mitigate that risk. The long-term risk and harm is kind of being transferred by companies that don't want to take some simple steps. Truly, I'm not an IT professional. I thought I had done everything right to protect myself, but all it takes is one employee having an email that's infected, infecting your system. Businesses can fix a lot of problems with some money. The data that's being taken has quantifiable value. Getting your social security number back from the dark web that's now been sold and transferred is not something that can be solved with dollars. 
It's just difficult because it is based on the amount of money and losses, the amount of victims. They come in, they take the data, they know you've got backups, they may not even encrypt your system, and they're just extorting you for that data. It can be a material event for a company. I've always known there's a lot of bad actors out there, but you just don't realize that can happen to you. I thought ransomware was aimed at large cities and big hospital systems. Why would they hit a dinky little doctor's office? But nope, they go after everybody. Any company that's connected to the internet can be a victim. Indeed, anyone connected to the internet can be a threat to others. There is hunters and hunted on both sides. Day to day, when they're sitting behind non-extradition countries like Russia and Ukraine, the hunters are the hackers, and the hunted are the companies and the rest of us. Society doesn't understand the fragility of critical systems. They are inextricably linked with computer systems now. They cannot function without them. In the virtual world, there is no location. It is easy for somebody in Russia to hack a bank in America as it is a bank two miles down the road. There's no borders in criminality anymore. Hello, my name is Peter Levashov. I'm a former cyber, cyber criminal, yes, so because I, I don't break, break law anymore. And now I stuck in the United States with you guys. Hi, everyone. I can do spam for you, and I send it to my own database. I was involved in all type of spam I can find, so it's pharmacy spam. Basically, men like to buy Viagra in internet. I am not sure why. So I have a small botnet with two bots, so I'm a bot master because I have the code executed on your machines without you knowing, so I'm a criminal. I probably was unknowingly involved in some early ransomware attack, but just spreading emails. I did. I am not confessing, so. I made like $200,000 in one day. And the United States government could arrest me any time, basically. I never felt like I'm doing something criminal until I was pushed there by United States law, not by Russian law. Now I understand, yeah, if there is a crime against United States citizen, basically it doesn't matter where you are. On, you can be on Mars with Elon Musk and the United States will prosecute you on Mars. So the judge told me in the United States, Peter, this is the moment when you should stop. My name is Arkady Book. I'm an attorney practicing for 20 years, specifically on the federal cases. Most of the cases from Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Romania, Moldova, and so on. When I began my practice back to 2002, there was very few hacking cases. And my first case accused a Russian hacker, charges of some $12 million stolen. The hackers felt that I talk the same language, things related to computer, mass, certain level of logic. They start recommending me, they start coming to the office, and as a result, they brought other smaller and larger fish. The number of hackers in the Russian-speaking community grew substantially. They found for me the best United States lawyer in my cases, and it was and it is still Arkady Buch. Hundreds and hundreds of different cases through all his career. He showed me the weak places in my case, and he told me how I should like shake it. Uh, this, is, this is the most important for me. As someone who grew up in a Russian-speaking culture, Russian-speaking cybercrime has been a social moment. Russia lost 27 million in the Second World War. Most of them were men. So a lot of us actually grew up without fathers. Father is pretty much someone who teaches you the rules. If you skip this line, you understand how relativistic the rules are. I've 
talked to a number of hackers who say, look, we were born in a culture breaking things and testing things. So if your culture is one of challenging authority, then challenging security is another way of challenging authority. They are computer analysts, software writers, very different from cartel people, drug dealers, or gangsters. They were understanding the rules are not working. Let's find new ways. We'll be innovative. We'll take new routes. And they keep reaching their destination. The main reasons why most of the hackers is a Russian speaker, very good computer and science education, number one. And number two is ability to master their skills. Here in the United States, if you'll try to penetrate the system, the possibility you're gonna get prosecuted and arrested is extremely high. While sitting in Russia, you can spend thousands and thousands of hours stealing from companies while not being prosecuted because there's no extradition treaty. I remember I was reading the news and the US had just announced sanctions and indictments against Russian hackers. I looked it up and there is a cyber most wanted list. I started thinking about these people and wondering how they feel being named and shamed on the world stage. The number one person we wanted to speak to was Maxim Yakubet. He is alleged to be the leader of a cybercrime group called Evil Corps. We managed to find an address for him in Moscow. We went to his house and knocked on his door, but he wasn't there. His dad answered. He gave us this incredible rant. <laughs> And I'll always remember his right eye was twitching the whole time. You seem very upset by the US and the UK's accusations. His son had been held up as the poster boy of Russian cybercrime. It was amazing to hear not from Jakobets, but from someone obviously very close to him, what it means for him to be on these lists. They genuinely believe that the US has caused Russia so much harm that what they're doing is actually a good thing. I have my experience, and my experience is quite big because I was providing service for like thousands of different, you can call them hackers. And I was never hiding my patriotic feelings about Russia. I was support my country all my life. There are videos of them driving supercars with their pet tigers. Their number plates even translate to thief. Russians have viewed cybercrime and cyber criminals as a national asset. But the challenge here is that the majority of critical infrastructure is owned and operated by private companies many of which don't even know that they're compromised right now because they have hackers moving through their systems as we speak, who instead of just burglarizing an environment, want to use that environment to attack everything it touches. They're learning how your water system works, how your electric system works to try to make the most money. The landscape has shifted where the victim company would look at a cyber attack as a nuisance. Instead of it being a nuisance, it actually stops the business from working. So we first heard about what happened to Norsk Hydro when they put out a press release saying they've had to suspend production at loads of their facilities that produce aluminium. A really important company that makes all the things that we use had been effectively brought to their knees by a cyber attack. First thing I did was to call the contact for the corporate emergency team so that we could take control of the situation. Within the corporate emergency team, we made a decision not to go into dialogue with the attacker and not to pay any ransom. Bear in mind, they probably would have been in their rights to be extremely concerned, but they decided we're going to take the long, hard road back to recovery from the ground up. We were really pleased that Hydro ordered private security companies to give us all the reports from their work. We were working around the clock. The corporate emergency team had three meetings a day and a number of other meetings. We were able to tell what happened from the start to the finish of a really significant cyber attack. 
It took altogether six to eight months before we were back into a fully normal situation. If you look at the total cost summarized after the 2019 attack, it's amounting to 800 million Norwegian kroner. We also had cyber insurance, which covered 75 million euro. The ransom, I think it was about $200,000, and they could have negotiated that down. They could have probably been up on their feet a lot quicker than they were, but they chose the high road. I've often said this about North Hydro. They are the kind of the gold standard of how a company should respond to an attack like this. One of the first questions we always get asked is, should I pay? And we're trying to get them to a quantitative decision on whether to even engage. If we lose all of our data right now, how much does that cost us? And is that more or less money than what we would have to pay? And that's just a simple math game. That's an Excel spreadsheet. Even if most companies say we don't pay, we wouldn't negotiate with terrorists, most companies are actually paying. It's really difficult to ignore it and take a principled position of public policy as opposed to saying, you know what? We need to worry about our clients, we need to worry about our business, our shareholders, and we need to think through this. Vulnerability in this area varies by company. This is one of the main problems of ransomware, is the fact is the benefits are personalized. If I'm a company, it makes sense for me to pay and I get the benefit, but the costs are socialized. It makes it much worse for everyone else because it incentivizes further bad behavior. Do you not pay them? 100%. I would encourage anyone who feels that they can take the monetary loss to not pay, to not do so. Do not fund their interactions. Do not give them money. They are criminals, and you should not encourage their behavior by paying them if you can afford to do so. And a lot of the people who can't afford great cybersecurity are small, independent businesses that an impact like that would cripple their business. One of the hardest things of going through the whole ransomware and deciding to close my practice was, again, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not that old um, and I'm not at retirement age yet and I wasn't ready to retire. After the initial shock of having to go through this, it was quite an ordeal. And part of the reason that I'm sharing my story is that I think it's really important for other physicians to know this is a possibility this can happen and can protect themselves against the bad actors that are out there. You know, I understand motivation of making a profit, even if it hurts other people, but, you know, I wouldn't wish what I went through because of these shitheads to happen to anyone else because it truly, truly sucked. If I could wave a wand and change our opinion on the ransomware issue, it wouldn't be as simple as, okay, people care. It would be how people perceive it. We should be really looking at these things as attacks on us. Most people in the free world had a sense of security. Ransomware really undermines that sense of security because all of a sudden, a business is shut down. This was done with the healthcare system. People couldn't get the healthcare they needed because the records were locked up. They have to turn patients away because their x-ray machines have been encrypted. We've had scenarios where people can't get their cancer results because they've been encrypted. It's, it's not just about data. It's losing hours and hours of sleep. It's stress. It causes health issues to the people having to deal with this. It's a very devastating real-world attack. It's not surprising that people are moving more and more into cybercrime because you're seeing people living the high life and you want a piece of that. Here's a profession where from the comfort of your home, you can cause mayhem around the world and you can earn a lot of money. They are able to distance themselves from this moralistic social framework. They don't care. That's why they're successful.
This is not like conflict of the past. This is not like a criminal threat of the past. This is a battlefield where trained and armed soldiers are not on the front lines. This is a battlefield where all of us are on the front lines. Yes, we know that cybersecurity is an issue, but we are not seriously considering enough the scale of what we are up against. We have to come to the aid of the average individual, as well as with large groups, with nation states, with entire industries. We have to do that at a scale that we have never taken on before as a society in any other aspect of human experience.